You know, the last few weeks I've spoken about love, the straw that stirs the drink. I spoke about compassion. And I want to still continue down that line because today, even mixed into it, because the love, the compassion, and what I'm going to speak about, it's all one thing when you put it, when you serve the Lord. Today I want to talk about mercy. Mercy. You know, when you hear the word mercy, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? What does it mean to us? Because that word mercy is mentioned 275 times in the Bible. And out of those 275, 100 of those uses of the word mercy is found in the book of Psalms. What? does mercy mean to you? What does mercy mean to me? You know, let's look at the main scripture verse for today and we see, we'll see what mercy looks like. And we find this in Matthew 9, 9 to 13. We're going to go through piece by piece, but Matthew 9, 9 to 13, we're going to read verses 9 and 10 first. It says, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. This is the same Matthew that turned out to become a disciple. And he said to him, follow me. So he rose and followed him. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax, collector, tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Let me stop right there. And I'll ask anybody here, I'll ask anybody watching, when was the last time that you ate? with a tax collector and a sinner. What was the last time? There you go. <laughs> Amen. You know, it's, it's too many times we surround ourselves with, with people that, that look like us, people that, 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 that think like us. And, you know, there's nothing wrong because that's who we naturally gravitate to. I'm going to hang out with James because James and I have something in common. Or, or I hang out with Vincent because we have something in common. And it, it's, it, it's natural that we do that, but get to it. In the church, it's getting to be like that, though, where we only hang out with people that think like us. People that share our beliefs. And if they don't share our beliefs, then people are rejected, like the tax collector and the sinner. We have so many different denominations in the body of Christ. And, and, and church, please understand, there's nothing wrong with denominations. However, when we elevate denominations over Christ, then there is division. If the people on the outside seeing the Anglican Anglican can't get along with the Baptist, can't get along with the Methodist, can't get along with anybody. If the tax collector and the sinner sees that, why would they even want to even think about church? Why would they want to think about church? When was the last time we ate with a tax collector and sinner? And you know what? The very people that are being rejected, the tax collector and the sinner, guess who was like that? We were. We were the tax collector. We were the sinner. I shared this story many a time, and, and, and I'll, if, 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 if you continue to follow Thrive Ministries, you're going to hear this story over and over and over again because I just think it's such an impactful story of what happens when you want to separate from the tax collector and the sinner. And how many of you know Mahatma Gandhi? Mahatma Gandhi was probably the greatest Hindu that ever lived. When they talked about Hinduism, Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi is one of the most respected leaders of modern history. A Hindu, Gandhi nevertheless admired Jesus and often quoted from the Sermon on the Mount. Once when the missionary E. Stanley Jones met with Gandhi, he asked him, Mr. Gandhi, though you quote the words of Christ often, why is it that you appear to so adamantly reject becoming his follower. Gandhi replied, oh, I don't reject your Christ. I love your Christ. It's just that so many of you Christians are so unlike your Christ. Apparently, 
Gandhi's rejection of Christianity grew out of an incident that happened when he was a young man practicing law in South Africa. He had become attracted to the Christian faith, had studied the Bible and the teachings of Jesus, and was seriously exploring becoming a Christian, and so he decided to attend a church service. As he came up the steps to the large church where he intended to go, a white South African elder of the church barred his way at the door. Where do you think you're going, Kafir? Kafir is a derogatory term for, 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 for Indians. The man asked Gandhi in a belligerent tone of voice. Gandhi replied, I'd like to attend worship here. The church elder snarled at him. There's no room for kafirs in this church. Get out of here or I'll have my assist assistants throw you down the steps. From that moment, Gandhi said he decided to adopt what good he found in Christianity, but would never again consider becoming a Christian if it meant being part of the church. Tax collector and a sinner. You see, Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus would have eaten and had a meal with Gandhi. He would have. That's just how he is. Because, like I said before, if you remember, look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 11. And, and, and listen, read, look at this. It says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortions will inherit the kingdom of God. Stop right there. So, oh. See that? It says all that stuff. Thieves, covetous, drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortions will inherit the kingdom of God. Now guess what? Of all those things from verse 9 to verse 10, we fit in one of those categories, somewhere, somehow, right? It may not be this, but we're talking about a sinner. We were sinners. Go to verse 10, 11, sorry. What does it say? Paul is saying, and such were some of you, such were some of us. We were all tax collectors and sinners at one point. But you were what? You were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. Are you hearing me, church? We were. We were the tax collector and sinner. We were the Gandhi that tried to get in the church, but the difference was is we were accepted and not rejected because of us. <laughs> When's the last time you were the tax collector and sinner? Let's go back to the main scripture, Matthew, Matthew 9, 9 through 13. We're going to go to verse 11. Remember, the Pharisees just saw Jesus sit down with tax collectors and sinners. So the next thing on verse 11, it says, And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Because you see, the Pharisees could not even fathom in their minds why Jesus would eat with the tax collectors. Listen, look at his answer. Verse 12. When Jesus heard that, because they just asked him, why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that in verse 12, he said, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. A doctor, church, will have no practice unless he has a sick to tend to. A mechanic will have no business unless cars break down and a mechanic tends to them. I'm in the cleaning business and I would have no cleaning business. I would have no job unless there was dirt being made by others. <laughs> Church, a Christian would have no use here on earth if there were not tax collectors and sinners. A Christian 
would have no use here on earth if they were not tax collectors and sinners. Because we are here for one reason, and that is to be the messenger to save that which was lost. Amen. The people that are lost. That's why we're here. Amen. But the crux of this whole episode regarding mercy comes down to this verse, Matthew 9, 13. Matthew 9, 13. It says, Jesus says, listen, you remember, they, 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 they want to know um, why, why are you doing this? And he says, you know, the doc, the, 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 those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, they have need of it. But he says, but you know what? But go and learn what this means. Let me tell you what this means. I desire mercy. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I started today asking, what does mercy mean to us? You see, we see Jesus show mercy to the tax collector and the sinner. But for us to truly understand why he did it, we need to understand what Jesus means by saying, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Let me give you one, one, one definition. Mercy is to help someone despite of who they are or what they did. Mercy is to help someone despite of who they are or what they did. Think about our lives. Think that if someone was not merciful to us, where would we be? James, did you save yourself? Somebody brought the gospel to you. Somebody had mercy on you. Vincent, did you save yourself? Somebody brought the gospel to you. Somebody had mercy on you. Jesus saw the tax collectors and did not look at the people they cheated. Because you see the tax collectors in those days. Think about this. The tax collectors were Jews sent by the Roman government to tax their own people. And while they were taxing their own people, they said, okay, since I'm going to tax my people, I might as well get some money off of it. So instead of, if they owe 100, they said, listen, you owe the government 200. 100 for the government, 100 for them. So a tax collector was really a hated person by the Jews. Jesus had mercy on them. He sat down, he ate with them. Let me tell you another thing. Mercy also is not giving one the full consequences of what they truly deserve. Mercy is not giving one, the full consequences of what they truly deserve. When people go to court, they throw themselves on the mercy of the court. When you plead guilty, you throw yourselves on the mercy of the court. You say, listen, I am guilty. I know what I deserve. But I'm asking you, your honor, not to give me what I truly deserve. He's asking for mercy. And, 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 and some of the words used for mercy is like leniency, Clemency, compassion, grace, pity, forgiveness, forbearance. Mercy is the kind or forgiving treatment of someone who could be treated harshly. Think about what I'm saying. If somebody wrongs you, you have and you 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 have every right, or you feel you have every right to 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 get revenge or get back at them, and you would well you would be well within your right to do so, but yet you choose not to. That, that is mercy. But what does Jesus desire of us? He desires us to be merciful. Why should we be merciful? Because God was first merciful to us. Amen. Amen. Come on now. That's it. We can, I can stop, I can stop the, the, the whole sermon right now. That's it. That's the crux of this whole sermon. Because God was first merciful to us. Look at Romans 5, 8. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were still 
sinners. He didn't wait for us to be cleaned up. He didn't wait for us to get it right. He didn't wait for anything. He says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us in our mess. He died for us. Titus 3, 4, and 5, look at this. It says, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward men appeared, when Jesus appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of, the re of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. We can't work our way. Just like I asked James and I asked Vincente, could you save yourself? I can't save myself. They can't save yourself. Nobody can save themselves. He saved us. What are we talking about here? We're talking about salvation. We couldn't work for it. We couldn't earn it. We couldn't buy for it. We couldn't trade it. Nothing. Salvation is nothing but pure mercy. God, in a, in a position of power, did not give us what we truly deserve. Because we know what it says in Romans 23, 23. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All. All. You know what all means? You know, I always tell you, you know what all means, James? All. All. That means without excluding anybody, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the payment for us falling short, it says, for the wages of sin, because we all fall short, is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Death is what we deserve. Without God's mercy, none of us would be here. Why would God show us mercy? 1 John 4.19 we love him because he first loved us. Amen. We love him because he first loved us. Because he first loved us with the knowledge of knowing what we do to his son. He first of lo uh, loved us with the knowledge of, of, of even what he, what do you even look around in the world? What is happening now? But Jesus is still beckoning. Jesus is still calling. Jesus is still merciful. You know, right now, if Jesus came and said, you know what y'all deserve? He could wipe it. He would be well within his right. The God, our Father in heaven, would be well within his right to just wipe out this whole world. He would be well within his rights. But for mercy, church, mercy. God showed us mercy because of pure love. Pure love. Love. You know, with with such an act of mercy towards us, we we literally have no right but to be nothing but merciful towards everyone else. What's human nature? Human nature is to get even with those that wrong us. And, and, and don't say, oh, Pastor Neil, sometimes I, I know that, oh yeah, sometimes when somebody does 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 me wrong, I feel like I feel like I want to get right back at them. Maybe I know we have you super Christians in here, but me, sometimes I feel like getting right back at them. Because that's human nature. Being merciful is not easy. However, when we, all we have to do is look back and compare the amount of times that God was merciful to us. I can't even come up with a number. I don't know. The amount of times God was merciful to me, I don't have a number. I don't even know if they invented that number yet. Mercy. You know, some of us even have somebody that rubs us the wrong way we don't want to be around. Try mercy. Try mercy. Don't avoid them. Show mercy towards them because our Father in heaven never avoided us. Show mercy. Matthew 9, 13, again, he says, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus was literally telling the Pharisees that they have no clue what they're talking about. He says, you know what? 
Go and learn what this means. You guys are not ready yet. Go and learn what this means. You see, they were basing their opinion on valuing some type of ritual sacrifice over being compassionate and showing mercy to others like Jesus did. How many times are we like the Pharisees? Someone messes up, and like I just confessed, someone messes up, and our only option, our only option in our mind is let's hammer them. Let's get back at them. But you know what? If, if that is my thought process, I need to do and listen to what Jesus said, that I need to go and learn what this means. That our Father, Jesus Christ, He desires us. He desires mercy and not sacrifice. Why should we be merciful? Mercy is fulfilling God's requirement. Mercy is fulfilling God's requirement. Look at Micah 6, 1 through 8. It's eight verses, a little bit long, but, but, but just stick with me while I, while I read it. It says, hear now what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint and you strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a complaint against his people and he will contend with Israel. Verse three says, O my people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Testify against me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled. And what Balak, the son of Beor, answered him from Acacia Grove to Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. Let's the verse 6 now. What shall I come before the Lord? and bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Verse eight, listen to this church. He has shown you, O oh man, O oh woman, O oh people, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of me? What does the Lord require of us? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. You see, the people of Israel wanted to offer all sorts of sacrifice. And remember, he says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. They wanted to do this to gain what is good. How the Lord told them all these things were literally meaningless because that's not what he wanted. He said what he wanted for us, for me, for you to do was to act justly, love mercy, walk humbly. And church, this was not a piece of, of, of advice. It was a requirement. It was a requirement. He required it of you. He says... You know, what does it mean to act justly? And the word justice comes from, the, from just. And to act justly means to make our decisions in a manner that reflects justice. We often um, hear about scales of justice. And the scales of justice is usually, um, I, I had a picture of it, but I forgot to uh, give it to Yvonne. But uh, it's usually a lady holding two scales with, 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 with uh her eyes blindfolded to say, justice is blind. But what the scales do, the scales, you put something on here and something on here. And what you're supposed to do is the scales supposed to equal each other out. I remember back in Jamaica when I used to go to the market, I used to see those scales all along. And they'd have that one pound weight, the two pound. Oh, I want a pound of rice. They'd put a pound on the one side and then keep on pouring until it was even. That's how the scales, that's what justice is. The equal, equal, to, to bring things equally, you know, and, and when we act justly, when we act justly, there must be equal treatment for everyone when an offense is committed. Equal treatment, not revenge, not getting over it, equal treatment. That's what it means to 
act justly. Walking humbly is about putting our will into subjection under the will of God. Putting our will into subjection under the will of God. Now, look what the scripture says about mercy. We are, and, that, and, and this is what it's about today. We are to love mercy. Not do, but love mercy. Mercy should be a part of us. To the point that it's one of the first things we go to when we are wrong. Not revenge. But do we love mercy? Do we love mercy? Why should we be merciful? Because we should be merciful so that we can receive mercy. What? We should be merciful so we can receive mercy. What do you mean, Neil? You mean I have to be merciful? For yeah. But where did you get that from? I'm glad you asked me, Vincente. Matthew 5, 7, New King James Version. It says, blessed are the merciful because they're going to be blessed because they are merciful. Why? For they shall obtain mercy. Some of us want mercy, but we're not merciful. Too many times we wait around on somebody to do something before we move. I wait on somebody to be merciful to me before I show mercy. Well, according to this scripture, it's you got it backwards, it's opposite. We have to be proactive. We need to do things first. You know, it's like I'm waiting on my wife to apologize before I say I'm sorry. Mercy. Church, if you want to be forgiven, we have to learn to forgive. If, if we want to be loved, we must first love. If we want to serve, then stop waiting to be served. If you want mercy, then we must be merciful. Not just in mercy, but in life. We need to stop waiting on somebody to do something before we act. The only time we need to wait is when we are waiting on the Lord. That's it. Mercy. Mercy is something so powerful, but so hard to get if we don't show ourselves merciful. You know, I thought about mercy, and I and I said, mercy, mercy, mercy is should be thought of of of, of as how we treat love. Because, you know, when we think of mercy, it must not be thought of as a task. When we think of love, we don't think of it as a task. And let me show you what I mean. In Matthew 22, 36 to 40, it says, and this is, this is a, a, a rich young ruler uh, speaking to teach. He said, teacher, which is the great, greatest commandment in the law? He said, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. So the greatest commandment is to love. We are commanded to love. We are commanded to love our wives. We are commanded to love each other. But let me ask you a question. Love through Jesus Christ is in us in such a way that when I love my wife, I'm not loving my wife because I'm commanded to love my wife. I'm not friends with Vincente because I'm commanded to be friends with Vincente. Well, actually, I, I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? There is something greater within us. Let me tell you, this love calls us to love the unlovable. How do you do that? The way we do that, because the living God has deposited in us a piece of him called the Holy Spirit. The same God that loved us has given us something within 
us that has caused us to love others and that enable us to truly live a lifestyle of love. The same DNA that is in the Father has been deposited in us. Richard E. Simmons, author of this book I'm reading, author of Reflections on the Existent, Existence of God, writes, this is what is so unique about Christianity. It is not about a religion where you attempt to follow laws and regulations. Christ seeks to work in our hearts and to empower us. Christianity is about the life of God working in the hearts and souls of men and women. I read that yesterday and I'm like, wow, I have to somehow get this in the sermon because this is, <laughs> this is too good of a quote to, to, to you know, I'm going to read it again. This is what is so unique about Christianity. It is not about a religion where you attempt to follow laws and regulations. It's not about following laws and regulations. It's not about us loving somebody because God says. It's not about being, being merciful because God says. It's beyond that. It's beyond that. It has become a part of our DNA. Christ seeks to work in our hearts and to empower us. Christianity is about the life of God working in the hearts and souls of men and women. You see, mercy is to walk in perpetual forgiveness because of Jesus Christ. That's it. Mercy is something that we have in us that we have already forgiven something that is going to happen to us next week. Are you getting that? There is going to be something that happens to us next week, next year, next couple years that we already have granted mercy and have already forgiven it before it even happened. That's what living and walking in mercy looks like. That's what living and walking in love looks like. We're not waiting on something to happen before we forgive. We forgive. Luke 6, 27, 36 says, But I say to you, who here love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, give uh, goods. Do not ask them back. And just as you want them to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Verse 32. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. Verse 35. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the thankful and evil. So he just went down a whole list, but he, he, he encapsulated it all in one verse. He says, therefore, be merciful, just as your father also is merciful. That whole list is about nothing but showing mercy. Be merciful. Church, Jesus desires us to be merciful to others which is despite even when they live against the will of God, we are still to show mercy to them by reaching out to them, by loving them, and by revealing Christ to them. Just like how Christ was revealed to us. This is what Jesus was showing the Pharisees by eating the tax collectors and the sinners. The Lord desires mercy and not sacrifice. And we, church, are called to live a life of mercy. Matthew 9, 13 says, but go and learn what this means. Church, Christ is speaking to you and me. Go and learn what it means. 
Christ desires mercy and not sacrifice. When was the last time we ate with a tax collector and sinner? Because a tax collector and sinner needs God, God's mercy, and we are here to represent Christ to all. Christ has called us to go, go into the world to be merciful. When we show mercy to someone, they are usually blown away. Because imagine you are in ready to drop the hammer. They think you're going to drop the hammer on them and you love them and you hug them because of God's mercy. Church, to obtain mercy, we must be merciful. See, as we close, God's word requires us to be merciful to others. And I, today, church, I'm speaking to anyone out there today watching. And if right now you're sitting in a seat of judgment over somebody, if you are walking in unforgiveness, if you are walking, well, I can't do this, I can't do that, or they, uh, they have done this to me, they, they, they have done that to me, they have hurt me, they have done this. And you know what? All that is 100% true. But just because it's true doesn't give us the right to sit in judgment. Christ forgave us. Christ was merciful to us. Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Let us today on this July 4th not look at each other as Democrat or Republican the left or the right, liberal or conservative, black or white, Methodist or Anglican, whatever you want to put in that, that, their butt heads, that's not what Christ called us to look at each other as. Let us look at each other as a declaration of independence declared. It says all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creators with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Church, I'm here to tell you, to fulfill what the Declaration of Independence says, to fulfill the meaning of what the forefathers that wrote this says, you know what? It requires us to be merciful to each other. Always loving, always forgiving, always being compassionate, always showing mercy. Today, church, we are here, the one and only thing, to show mercy to each other. And by showing mercy to each other, you know what the people are going to see in us? They're not going to see Neil. They're going to see Pastor Neil. Oh, he can do this, he can do that. They did. Pastor Neil, we moved out of the way. When Pastor Neil shows mercy to somebody else, you know what they're going to say? Wow. What? Yeah, I mean, I may be the vehicle, but what caused Pastor Neil to show mercy to me when I deserve the worst? And being merciful allows us and opens the door that we, we may walk in and share the gospel of Jesus Christ to this world. Because church, we are in need of mercy. To obtain mercy, we must be merciful.